Grant Fox, welcome to Between Two Beers. Good to be here, guys. All Blacks squad was named this week. Mm -hmm. It's coming to the end of your tenure as a selector. Is there a bit of emotion attached to that now? You've got one more squad to be involved with? No, no more squads. Three no teams squads. to pick, all right? So three Irish test teams, but no more squads. And is there emotion? No, not really. Um, um, because not about me, it's about the group, right, and about their performance. Um, and, you know, I've, I'm in my 11th season doing this, and I've, you know, it's been a great ride, a hell of a privilege. Uh, but it's time to stop and go and do something else and give someone else a chance. And I'm a chance, and I'm, I don't get a motive around this sort of thing as as a rule. Um, you know, it is time for me to get my weekends back, you know, to spend more time at home, to spend more time at the beach place, to spend more time with the grandkids. So um, in that regard, it, it's actually looking forward to what's ahead of me rather than reflecting on, sort of, you know, what's been, which has been a hell of a ride. Um, but what's done is done. Not quite yet, but nearly. You, you speak about emotion. There was some great footage of Stephen Petofeta with the Blues getting yep. named, hearing his name for the first yep. time. How different was that team naming from your very first All Blacks team <laughs> naming? Well, 1984? Uh, yeah, 1984. 1984, yeah. It was, uh, I don't know when it was, August or Octo uh, September, October 1984 for a little trip to Fiji. But I, I was actually at my girlfriend's place, now my wife, at, well, her parents' place actually in Waterview. Um, <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon after an NPC game. And I remember vividly being there. I think there were a few other people around just listening on the radio. That's how it was, though, That's right? That's how it was in those days. Um, now it's very different. In fact, yesterday's um, um, announcement was very different again because they had a big Pacifica flavour, um, you know, the venue, um, you know, some, some song and dance and, um, um, you know, religious stuff chucked in. It was just, and that's just a reflection of, the diversity of our group nowadays, you know. Um, so it was actually, it was cool to be part of. It was just, it was it was elevated again. Rather than the formal sit with the media on the podium, wait for, I'm going to say this at times, the inane questions that get chucked at us, um, it was just done differently. I thought, I thought it was great. Awesome. Bit of pressure now with the with the no, name. With your name no, 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 no. I don't put you. I don't put you guys in that category. Please don't take offence. <laughs> no, it's a good. So the way we do things between two beers, we often tell the audience how we know the guests. So Shay, how do you know Grant Fox? Uh, let's go back to about 1990. Mm -hmm. I'm growing up in Topo, and I've got a blue jumper with a stylized foxy on the front. I used to wear that to Hilltop Primary School. You'd also find me on the top field taking six steps back, two steps to the side, wiggling the fingers and then trying to pop one over the goalpost. So quite a, a, a big part of growing up. And Mate, how much shit did you cop for that down there? Well, I had two, I had, I had two styles. <laughs> I had two styles. I had the round the corner, but occasionally I, I had the Mel Meninga, the toe oh, punk because yeah, State yeah. of Origin was going on at yeah, the same yeah, time. Yeah. But and you're quite a power bottom Shay, aren't you? So those kicks would come strong, quite far. yeah, strong, <laughs> strong lower half. So I was, yeah, I was able to, to pop them over from halfway of a, yeah. of a smaller sized field. But the, the other thing, the other standout memory I have from from that time, and please don't burst my bubble and ruin the illusion, but I think Auckland came down with the shield in 1992, and they played King Country to Delaney Park, and it was for me, it was amazing. Yeah. Like all these people you'd only ever seen in all black shirts or on TV had mm -hmm. come to town. Um, my memory tells me you played. Please don't. Again, please don't destroy the illusion because 10-year-old me would be distraught if you weren't there. I do remember Terry Wright being on the wing and that's because I thought he was an interesting looking character mm -hmm. more than anything. But that's my, those, yeah. are, my, those are my vivid memories. Oh, of, I'm of, not going to prick your bubble. It is likely <laughs> I did play because I, I, I can only remember getting sort of stood down for one game while they gave um, another player you know, a game. But in those days, we didn't change the team you know, as often as we do nowadays. But you know, the landscape's very different. Yeah. Um, so we're not comparing apples and apples, but yeah, likely. Very good. Well, yeah, no, it was I'll cool. That. It was cool taking the shield on tour. Oh, you know, we'd had it. We'd had it at home for a while, and we're very proud of that. And I guess the next logical step was to challenge ourselves and take it further afield and into some areas that may not have seen the shield for a while or seen. It was a pretty, a pretty good footy side we had. Oh, it was amazing. Um, and so to, I guess to see this team play in their own backyard, you know, hopefully the locals enjoyed it. I did very much so. Mm. Steve, have you got as vivid memories of Grant Fox playing rugby? So I was eight when you retired in 93. Mm -hmm. So I don't have memories of you actively, but obviously since then I've watched footage, I've heard of what people have been saying about you play. But from my role in the media, it's been really interesting watching Ryan's journey, you mm -hmm. know, starting as son of Grant Fox when he sort of first 
got a little bit of prominence and now very much be in his own star. And it's mm. almost like your dad of Ryan Fox again, mm. like to see that come full circle. Mm. And I'd love to sort of dig around in that area to start with because mm. I, I think it's quite fascinating. When when he's doing really well, as he has been over the last few years, yep. how much of his golf are you watching? Are you uh, Heaps of it. Li- you're watching yeah. it live? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, look, he's not always on telly, but you know, when he's at the pointy end of the field, because the European Tour events are, are on Sky now live, and so, you know, if he's at the point in the field and there's a chance he's going to get coverage, we're up, right? So, and, and I'm getting older now, so it's getting harder to recover from that. Um, but there's live scoring, right? So, um, you know, my wife uh, follows it, you know, religiously. So the phone's by the bed at night if, if he's not going to be on telly. Um, and I want to sleep. I'd rather just wake up in the morning and find <laughs> out what's going on because you're trying to follow a hole by hole, you'll never get to sleep anyway. So, um, but, you yeah, know, we, we religiously follow. Is that an exciting thing to look forward to, knowing that he's like leading in the final round and he's like, shit, I'm going to set my alarm for 3 a.m. to watch my son potentially? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's look, it's cool to see him. You know, he, I mean, all you want for your kids is to be happy and healthy and chasing their dream. It doesn't matter how old they are. You know, Ryan's a mature adult now. Um, doesn't matter how old. You still want them to be doing that, and Ryan's doing it. And, you know, not everyone gets that opportunity. So he's lucky in that regard, but he's worked hard for it. Um, and he's living, you know, it's not an easy lifestyle, but you know, he, he doesn't complain about it. He's living his dream. Um, so it's cool in, in that regard. And I, I love the fact that he's excelling in a sport that's different than mine because inevitably there would have been comparisons if he had excelled in the same code I play. But now that, that he is his own man. So inevitably when they start, they are going to be the son of. I mean, that's just normal. Any, well, No matter what sport, that's where the recognition is going to start. But as they carve their own way and have their own success, and that flips on its head and you become the dad of, um, I'm really proud of that. Mm. That uh, European title he won uh, last year. Um, no, earlier this year. Earlier this year, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're obviously watching that, yep. you, you and your wife. Yep. Um, how do you celebrate? When he finally gets it done, are you breaking out the champers? No, not, not at that time <laughs> of the morning. <laughs> um, we're trying to get to bed and get some sleep, and, and which you're not going to sleep, you're that excited and, wa- and waiting for him to make contact so you can you can have a chat to him um but that was pretty cool because um, w- it was a nervous watch because he was leading by six so the expectations he gets it done oh, life doesn't always work like that and you know he had a stumble early but I was really proud of the way he stuck at it and um and just you know just kept his belief kept his attacking mindset you know and, and in the end got the job done comfortably but what that does actually made the watches since a lot easier because you know he's got job security yeah. so you know even though he's been in contention you know a couple of times seriously right at the end and one in a playoff it's an easier watch because while you desperately want him to get what he wants out of it it's not you know that he's got a job in 23 and 24 because that's the high risk thing about what they do um, is that each year you're sort of playing for your livelihood and the difference between the money they can earn on the bigger tour versus you know dropping down to the their feeder tour is significant. So um, we can now watch some. Well, he's got some real, real job security, and if it doesn't go so good, it's okay. Yeah. You know, he's still chasing his dream and still got that opportunity. And we know what he's going to be doing for the next two years, and we know how much sleep we're not going to be getting. <laughs> so Spe- speaking of that, yeah. Ryan, you mentioned you you were waiting for him to make contact. Ryan told retold. Yeah. <laughs> A very detailed and exciting story <laughs> of the 19th hole after he won in Ras Al Khaimah. Oh, yeah, he's told me this story. <laughs> At what yeah. stage did you actually make communication no, before, with him? No, no, before? So, no, no, no. So, w- I mean, what we do is we text, right? You know, well done, bud, and all this sort of stuff. And um, and keep them short because, you know, his text, his machine's going to mind you ours was. So it was pretty cool going through the night as people, there's lots of people up watching. You know, um, which is really neat getting texts in the last one where he got in the playoff. You know, his guys four a.m. in the morning they're still banging away, which is really cool. Um, but it, but then so we talked to him not long afterwards, um, and then he goes off and celebrates. But he rang me. Uh, I was at work. It was about midday the next day, and he had just got to bed. We well, had gone to bed, and he he rang. He said, oh, "Dad, I'm a bit pissed." <laughs> I said, "Well, so you should be." He said, "I've got to get a car in two hours." I said, "Well, for God's sake, don't go to sleep," because he had to get try and get it get a plane to connect to go home um, but he, when he got home he told me the story of what it, uh, the night it was really cool eh? the yeah. fact that they've got I mean these guys are fierce competitors right they all want to win but they all want each other to do well and they'll celebrate each other's success and you know he's got some some really good mates on that time and, and particularly the South Africans you know because they're rugby fans too um, and you know some Australian mates so he, it was really cool that they you know they 
went deep into the night with him, <laughs> which was neat. Because you got to sit these winnings few and you know, at, the, at you know the level they play at. It's you know even the best in the world don't win that often. So you got to celebrate them, don't you? Yeah. So we've had like eighty five ish guests on this podcast now. Wow. One of the ones that gets quoted back to us or recommended or, or passed on is Ryan Fox. Mm-hmm. Uh, the openness he spoke with, like his, I don't know, the, the genuine sense of he was who he was, he had great stories to tell, and he's reached the very top of his field, uh, was great. So we have this sort of two-hour chat, and we really mm-hmm. form a connection. And one of the cool things about this podcast is we hold those connections, and then we can use them to get info on future <laughs> guests. Oh, <okay. laughs> so who better am I, to get, am, I, am I getting warned now? So what's coming? Who better to get an inside line on Grant Fox than his son? So he sent us in a couple of uh, little bits and pieces, and I'm, I'm going to read the yeah. first one. He said, um, Dad is just so competitive, and that's where I got it from. Growing up, all I wanted to do was beat him in stuff. Tennis, table tennis, golf, yeah. snooker. And he couldn't let oh, me win jeepers. Hold on. at anything. What finds that? Have I got a, have I got a skull one or something? Nah. Well, well, we, we, could, we couldn't. Actually, f- it, was, it was John Kerwin, but never mind. JK, <laughs> <laughs> <Give> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I'll just hold on. Give Sorry, him, JK. Give him our regards. We, uh, we had a great oh, two-hour chat with him uh, yeah. last year. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's sorry, that's my bad. That's amazing. My that, bad. That's just sorry. Sir John Kerwin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Straight to voicemail. Okay, he continues. Um, as I got older, I could compete at table tennis, but he gave up tennis before I could beat him, citing arthritis in his wrist. Mm-hmm. But it took a long time to beat him off the stick in golf. I was 15 when I first did it at Formosa, and I remember him not talking to me for two days because he played so badly that I got him. Now Ryan told his version of that yeah. and remem- remembered it quite strongly. Do you yeah. have the same vivid I actually don't. I don't specifically remember the day, but I don't doubt that it's accurate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't doubt that it's accurate. So, I mean, he's got a, I reckon Ryan's got a nice blend because you talk about that podcast, which I, I didn't know he had done, and I listened to it because a mate of mine, you know, texted me and said, you got to effing listen to this. It's really good. And so I listened to it, and he, he's really good at dealing with the media, in my view, and he's very level in terms of, Whatever's going on, um, he'll talk, right? He's had a bad day, he'll still talk. You know, he's walking down, he's under pressure early on in that event that he won, and he still talks to the media walking down a fairway, and a lot of people might have waved mm. him away. But, um, well, he's, in a way, he's got my competitiveness. His, his nature it comes from his mother, <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> it doesn't come from me. So um, I think he's got a nice, r- real sort of nice little balance in that way. Um, but, yeah, I don't. I sort of vaguely remember the day, and I probably was as grumpy as hell because you want to keep beating him for as long as you can because the moment he beat me in golf, I knew that was it. Yeah. Although now with the handicap systems, I keep reminding him, every now and again, I might just have a chance under the handicap system because that's the beauty about golf. You know, you can No matter your, your ability, because of the handicap system, which is pr- pretty unique, you can still have a competition amongst mates to depend, even if you've got differing abilities. Mm. When he beats you at golf, you're yep. obviously quite a tidy golfer. Is that the moment when you're thinking, shit, the boy's really got something here? He could really have a future? Or did you know before that? Oh, look, um, when he said to it, I mean, it became apparent to us that, that golf really, you know, it, it had him, right? It really, um, it was where he wanted to be. I mean, he was a very good cricketer at school. He played three years of first 11 cricket and, and was very capable, Um and, and, you know, wasn't a bad footy player. I thought cricket probably was his better game, but he played first 15 rugby. But inevitably, you know, the son of was a difficult situation for him and he, he, he stopped playing rugby when he finished school. Played one year of premier cricket for Papatoa in Auckland, but then really just wanted to chase golf. Um, and I can remember him coming to Adele and I and saying, you know, this is what he wants to do. And we were sort of like, yeah, bud, um, um, we, love, we love that. But this, this is a tough gig to crack from little old New Zealand. Um, so maybe we suggest you have a backstop just in case it doesn't work and you need to go to uni and get uh, qualification, which he did. took him a year longer because of all the amateur golf than it normally would. And he's, he's a fairly smart boy, Ryan, so he cruised that, through that pretty easily. And ironically, it's probably helped him a little bit you know, mentally on the, on the golf circuit. So he came to pro golf a little bit later, but playing amateur golf, uh, going around early in the competition, well, it was very clear that he was longer than most of them. Um, and could play some miraculous shots, but he was a little bit wayward, yeah. <laughs> um, simply because he just wanted to crank it. Um, so he learned how to play a whole lot of shots because he was hitting from some incredibly challenging places. So he learned how to hit low punches and draws and cuts and all sorts of things because I think that's, you know, because he got himself in a bit of trouble, but it's like, well, 
you can't coach length. So you've got to smack it. And then as you get up, as you want to keep chasing this and you get a bit more help coaching, you can narrow it up a bit and try and hit it a little bit straighter and that length becomes a real asset. Mm. Um, but the other part of it is is a lot of this golf early was, was um, and I, I caddied for him and travelled with him around New Zealand, was, was match play. And his competitive nature and his belief was he could be down or hit himself in the crap and say, Dad, I'm going to make birdie. Or Dad, I'm going to win this. Just so it was then I started to think, well, just maybe, you know, this kid wants to dedicate himself. Um, there's a bit of natural talent there, but it's a hard gig to crack. But if you don't try, you'll never know. Mm. So, um, you know, um, give it your best shot. It's turned out turned out pretty good. Was it easy to separate Dad and Caddy when you were on the bag for him on the on the tour? Uh, early, 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 no, probably. If I'm brutally honest, because you're so, I mean, um, you're so desperate to see them want to do well. That sometimes you you sort of you, you you've got to get the emotion out of it, and I probably because of my competitive nature struggled a bit with that early, and even Ryan would say that too. You know, we didn't always see eye to eye on the golf course early. It's it's a lot easier now. There's a lot of people around him who who can really help him. My the thing at the start for me is that that he really needed you know um, um, I mean needed some funding to help me the, get the, going. The bank, <laughs> needed, mum and dad <laughs> needed the bank of mum and dad to help me. Did a, you know quite a bit of travelling with them, and luckily I was in a business that you know that I owned that I had the time to go and do that, and um, and could you know my help with him was it wasn't the technical golf side; it was more the mental side to try and because he had high expectations of himself, so trying to keep himself calm when things weren't going so well was perhaps where where I could help. But at times it was like, well, you play this game all the time. How can you hit it that wide? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I sort of had to, that was probably the thing that was like, I, and that, that's where I had to give myself an uppercut and try and, you know, try and be the caddy and not the emotive dad. Right. And it took some time, um, I guess, to get to that point. But, um, you know, um, it was just, it was great to share the fairways with him. Um, you know, and for, and mostly it was really good. You know, the odd part we had disagreements, but you know what what parent child doesn't sometimes. Yeah, the disagreements or not seeing eye to eye mm. is that as a caddy is that like you suggesting a certain club and he's saying, Dad, no, I've got this, and then hitting a shot like yeah, oh, maybe a little bit of that, or you know, or 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 missing a shot that you know maybe I thought my my expectation of what he was capable of at that time versus. You know, sometimes the outcome was might have been didn't quite match up my expectation for him, um, for it, for him wanting to succeed, not any reflected glory on my part because I'd had my own career, so not important for me at all. Was more, it was about him? Yeah. You know, I mean, trying to be the best he could be. You I'm, know. I'm, so, I'm, sorry, I'm curious yeah. when you're when you're on the bag and you're caddying, mm. are you also trying to? be the best caddy you can possibly be and like getting external yeah try and do that but I mean I haven't done it for a long time right so I'm, I'm trying to remember all the things but we did, we did a lot I mean all his amateur days I you know we went to a lot of places and I know around New Zealand went to Australia um, we went to America twice we went to a, a place in uh, Malaysian Borneo called Kota Kinabalu wow you know um, to try and qualify for what was the one Asia tour at that stage um, so we did we did you know went to Japan we did an awful lot of travelling yeah. um, China I don't uh, yeah. profess to know you, mm. but just judging by your nature, I could imagine you're studying up on what are the little tips as a caddy that I can. What are the one percenters? Uh, yeah, well, that, I can, I can get, that I can pass on to my player <laughs> slash son. Yeah, well, maybe not so much that it was more about again. It was more about the mental side, but also I guess trying to you know my my mindset is more around you know time trying to minimise risk because um, you're often hear the best in the world talk about minimising mistakes, and Ryan was all about well. You know, I'm going to attack like hell. It's still his mindset, really, now. Um, so I was trying to maybe get the... You know, that's where we were wired, perhaps, a little bit differently. Um, but it was, it was just, you know, the travel experience, um, trying to understand what he wanted from me mm. um, and making sure that I could do that. You know, that took some, you know, some um, interesting chats at t- from time to time to do, to do that. But it, then it became apparent that, one, I couldn't keep travelling. When he turned pro, I did the early stuff, but he needed his own team and, and someone who could genuinely help him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's when he get to, gets to a point where you know he has a, he has a caddy, a full time caddy who can do that job properly. I just want to echo you, what you said before about Ryan and the media. I think he is the best in New Zealand at 
responding to the media, dealing with the media, having a good relationship. Like you say, he's so mm. open. And in this email he sent, like he's an incredibly busy man mm. and he's playing golf and he's flying around the country and he's got a lot on. But he's he took the time to write this really lengthy email, so I'll continue. He says, um, Dad is not really re- renowned for his patience and he has a short fuse, especially on the golf course. I heard this story from my chiropractor years later and he's one of Dad's good mates. So we're on the course at Mount Monganui over the Christmas holidays when I'm a teenager. Dad hasn't played too well and had a couple of club throws and plenty of swearing early in the round. On about hole seven, I hit a bad shot and threw my club and had a bit of a tantrum. As we walk off the tee, he turns to Woody, who's my Mm -hmm. Cairo, his mate, Mm -hmm. and goes, I'm sorry for this and I know it's hypocritical, but I've got to give Ryan the bollocking for throwing his clubs. So he then heads over to me and absolutely tears me a new one. Do you remember this? I don't remember it, but it'll be true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it'll be true. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I do. I'm not the most patient person in the world. Um, those who know me know that. Um, and I guess it was what it didn't sort of, like, it's still not good. Didn't matter so much if I did it, but he, with a stage he was trying to get to, for him to be seen doing that probably wasn't a good thing. And so it was. It would have been a very hypocritical chat. Um, anyway, it would have happened, no doubt. I don't remember it specifically, but yeah. I did play with Woody and him at the Mount on more than one occasion. So. Have you, the short fuse he talks yeah. about, is mm. that from childhood? Do you know where that comes no, from? No, I don't is know. That it's a, just, you know, I guess it's... It's I'm golf. A, I'm, it's a frustrating yeah, sport. I know. Yeah. I'm, it's, it's, I'm a perfectionist, so there's... Uh, and, and with an expectation, so, you know, I mean, for me with golf, I play off a reasonably low handicap. I don't play very often, so I go out there with an expectation that it's going to be good all the time. Mm. And when it's not, I get pissed off. <laughs> Yeah. Right, and and everyone has a different outlet about how they get rid of frustration, um, and some guys are really good at just bottling. I don't think bottling anything up helps at all, um, nor is throwing clubs just quietly, <laughs> um, and nor is swearing. But but for me, sometimes it's just like I, it's done. Right, I can do it and flush it, and next task. Mm. Right, not the best way. I mean, they're they're all. You, you, I I often watch sports people when things aren't going well and look for the little idiosyncrasies they have and trying to get them out of what an all blacks would call redhead and get them back to blue head right so get out of the the, 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 the red mist where your brain's fogged into blue head which is very clear right and focused and task focused I often watch for little things about you know what do these guys do mm. I mean if you and, and this is not a uh, so I'm not, this is a good thing I'm going to so Rafa has a very, very idiosyncratic um, thing before he plays shots, doesn't he? Mm. And, and even when he doesn't walk on lines, and he do, everything is very routine-based, right? And he does the same thing. Now, that's not about, I guess, dealing with frustration. That's, I guess, trying to make it to a point where he doesn't get frustrated. So it's all about focus. Um, and there's lots of um, mental stuff that will tell you about these little things that people can do. And, and um, Rafa just does the same thing all the time. And for him, it's about making sure, I think, that he's in the zone, task-focused for every individual point. Did you develop that same thing with your goal kicking? Uh, look, uh, at the time, yeah, I didn't yeah, know I did, that. Yeah, yeah. I did stand <laughs> 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 nice. At the time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have recognised it like that, but I am very routine-based. I'm going to boarding school, so I blame boarding school for that. You had yeah. to be at boarding school. In the days I went to school, it was you know somewhat Tom Brown school days in a way. So you had to be very routine-based because of it was a very time sensitive environment you operated in day to day you know get up at this time shower you know walk around the block shower be at school you know meals everything laundry had to be in by you know and you only had a limited amount of of, of sort of civilian clothes so to speak and as a little amount of school uniform and I had to go through the laundry system because you only had so much space to store it in so <laughs> Blame boarding school for this best thing. You know, one of the best things my parents did was send us away to Auckland Grammar School, me, uh, me and my two younger brothers. But very routine based. Um, I still have that to this day, and that's perhaps partly where a lack of my um, uh, patience comes from. Is like I like things to be in order. Um, you know, I like to do things. I don't. I don't procrastinate. I don't. I don't put things off. I, if I, something needs to be done, it gets done now or very very soon. Tick that box. What's next? So, um, <laughs> yeah, pretty hard. I'm nearly 60. It's bloody going to be hard to change this. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's great. Well, so, last one from Ryan, and then, then we'll move mm. on. So, uh, he says, 
He always used to caddy for me and travel around the country and the world following tournaments when I was an amateur. We had a solid group of guys from the same club we used to travel with. Yeah. And Dad always played the practice rounds at tournaments with us. He loved nothing more than reminding the guys that he was beating them off the stick in a practice round or that he'd outdriven them on a certain hole. He never realized that they got plenty of entertainment every evening when Dad would get on his laptop and check his emails. When something didn't work properly or fast enough, he thought the only way to fix it was either hit it or swear at it. Then eventually I'd hear something along the lines of, Ryan, come and fix this stupid fucking thing for me. All while the boys were in tears on the couch, laughing at him, trying to whack a computer into submission. Yeah, still do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a technophobic. I know technology, we need it, but it frustrates the hell out of me, and that's my lack of patience. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I, I, I can't be bothered learning, to be honest, because, I mean, I've, I've got kids around us who know how it works. Um, and in my job, I've got very smart people around me who can come and fix shit. Mm. So rather than me, you know, I, I want other things I want to do. So I just bloody, I get frustrated and bash things, hoping that they'll fix. And if they don't, I'll ask for help. Yeah, I probably should just take a deep breath and ask for help straight away. But anyway. It's funny, the technology thing, the generational divide, you know, because we grew up with the internet. So we're typically mm -hmm. quite good at that sort of thing. But new themes come along. TikTok with Shay. I don't keep trying to get with him a TikTok. TikTok. Me, Virtual yeah. reality is around the corner, and I'm like, I don't know if I can be bothered learning. I, I'm that not bothered with any of it, right? Yeah. I'm not on social media, um, to be honest. I, uh, within reason, I tried to read as little media as possible, mm. um, and certainly not on social media. Mm. On on the the dad stuff. Um, so I've got three young kids. Yep. Um, and I'm on that journey of trying to turn them into into good humans. When you look at Ryan, and like we said from the podcast, he comes across so well. Mm -hmm. uh, are you as proud of the person he is as what he's achieved, or, or, or like how? I'm actually I'm more proud of the person he is. He's achieving incredibly well, but he's a good human being, Ryan. Um, and he's a, he's a, he's not you know, not only he's been a good you know he's been a, a great son for Adele and I, and we got a daughter too, Kendall, who's a little bit younger, who's who's also you know a wonderful human being. Um, so um, we're proud of what he's achieving, but we're proud of the man he's turned into um, because. You know, he's, he's married with a child. He's a great dad, um, very hands-on. Um, and he's got a neat balance in his life. You know, he's found the balance between this is what I'm dedicated to and when I need to do that. But he's also good at switching off and doing other stuff. Uh, and the other thing I really like is he's very connected to his schoolmates. I love that, the fact that, that when he comes home, they, they go fishing, they go out to dinner, they play golf together. He's still very connected to them. You know, he hasn't lost them along the way. Uh, which I, I, I think is really cool. And, man, they give him shit, apparently, on the text machine and social media and that if he's not going well, <laughs> apparently. it's I don't follow it because I'm not on social media, but I, I, gather, it's quite, I gather it's quite humorous. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, as I said, I, I'm more proud of who he is than, than what he's achieved, even though he's achieving well. That's, that's so cool to hear. And, and for what it's worth, he, he also added that he really appreciated how present you were in his childhood and mm -hmm. how that helped shape him. I think yeah. he coached every one of his rugby yeah. teams right up to first 15, you know, always being there. So it seemed, it's really well, cool. My parents were for me and my two younger brothers too, you know. Um, I mean, we grew up on a, in a farming community um, in the Waikato. And so we had to travel to play junior rugby and cricket and stuff like that. And mum and dad, Saturday morning, always. The dad, my father coached teams, I, you know, with, with Woody's father, right? Um, so, and, and we had to travel. Matamata, Cambridge, Hamilton, Kogaroa, um, all those sorts of places around the Waikato. Otrahonga sometimes for the ro ro roller mills in those days. So we had to do all this stuff. Mum and Dad were ever present, giving their time, because I don't like sermons, but I'm going to say one thing that someone, I can't remember who said it to me, said to me a long time ago, and it's, this thing has resonated with me ever since. They said, how do you spell love to your kids? And most people can't answer it. But when you give them the answer, what I think is the right answer, they all get it. And it's spelled T-I-M-E, mm -hmm. not L-O-V-E. It's spelled T-I-M-E because time is love anyway. And so that's what the kid, they want people present in their lives um, and to be engaged in what they're doing and interested. And yes, there's boundaries and all those things you've got to set as a, as a parent. But that's that's what my parents did. So they were my role models, right? And so... and. Adele's dad um, was the same for her and her older brother, you know. So it's like we grew up in this these families that were like this, and that's where you get your first role model from, don't you? Mm. So um, it was just a no-brainer for us, and we loved doing it. Right, the fact that it's the right thing to do, 
uh, we just loved doing it. You know, it was hard when Ken was playing netball and Ryan when they were in different parts of Auckland. They had to divide your time. One went one way and one went the other. But if they're at different times, you'd go to both. Yeah. Um, and our daughter, who's got two two and a bit, one one more one more on the way. They've got all that ahead of them yeah. soon. Yeah. And they're all trying to figure out where are we going to go on Saturday mornings. Well, you'll figure that out eventually. <laughs> so. Brian, it's it's wonderful to hear you <clears> speak so effusively about your kids and, and the role as, as as a parent. And one of the great things I found in, in researching the pod was the work that you do with Big Buddy, mm-hmm. or the work that you've done in the past mm-hmm. with Big Buddy. For, mm-hmm. And for those that don't know, it's those kids who are fatherless, who, mm-hmm. who don't have that father yeah. figure in their life, that yeah. people are able to yes. um, volunteer their time to be yeah. that mentor for people. Yeah. Was that an influence of your childhood, of wanting yes. to give back? Yeah, and look, it, um, and as I was talking, I was thinking of that and how to weave that in, and I'm glad... Shame as you've asked. Um, I mean, I got, a guy came to me a, a, a number of years, five, six years ago now, just told me he had this idea. Um, now, there was already a Big Buddy Mentoring Trust, but it needed more financial support behind it to help develop this program. I mean, for all charities that are out there, you wish you didn't have to exist, you know, because you, you, you hope life was perfect. The reality is they need to, be, need to be. And so for me, straight away, the answer was yes, because all they're asking for me is a little bit of my time, and we've all got time to give. And it's love. Yeah. And, and the other part of that is I was fortunate. And there's a whole lot of kids, sadly, who are not as fortunate for a variety of reasons. I mean, Dad may have passed away. Dad just may, might be a good bugger who's just disappeared. Um, and Mum is left trying to be everything. And, and, and it's tough on Mum to do that and extended family. So this is about mate, seven to 14-year-old boys who haven't got a father in their lives and about a, a big buddy. Um, giving their time just to help um, this young young boy with a positive male role model. And I've heard lots of stories. Every time we have a big buddy fundraising lunch, one of the mums will come along and speak. And pff, I'm going to get emotional because it's incredible the stories they have and how big buddies help. So I'm lucky. Um, all I'm doing is giving some time. I'm not a big buddy. I'm behind the scenes helping try and, you know, um, get auction items to raise money and, you know, give time to sit on the, the foundation, which is the financial grunt behind this, to try and keep building this, to get it. Sadly, there's more of a need for it around the country, and we want to keep growing this thing. But we're sort of, you know, in, in reasonably small beginnings, even though it's been around a little while, and we, we want to keep growing it as much as we don't want to because we wish there wasn't a need. But um, there is a need, so we're going to keep pushing with it. Well, it's a wonderful thing that you do. It's mm. something that, uh, I guess, in my own kind of way, I don't have kids of my own. Um, Maybe it's something that I look into as just something to I kind of do it by default anyway with a lot of kind of yeah, I mean, they're, young they're, men in your life. These guys just want some, someone to, to, to turn up, to be consistent. So it's not, you know, it's a couple of hours every weekend or every second weekend where they just build this bond and they do shit that dad might do. And it could be just going to the beach. It could be going on a boat. It could be fishing. It could be building something. It could be, you know, shooting hoops. It could be anything like this at all. But it's just... It's about having someone they can depend on, which is, you know, kids want to depend on mum and dad. And again, you know, sadly, this, these young boys don't have dad for whatever reason, so they just want someone they can depend on. So when he says he's going to be there, he needs to be there. And this is what these big buddies do. They are dependable men who are giving back. Awesome. That's so that's so cool and so powerful. Um, <coughs> is there a is it a website bigbuddies.com or something that Yeah, something like that. I can Google it. I'm not yeah, yeah, technology. Yeah, we'll yeah, technology. We'll yeah, it. it might be dot org, I think, just, but I'm yeah. just thinking I know there will be people listening to this thinking that Yeah, I mean like look, look, I, I don't want to be be alarmist here, but there's a, a strong vetting process to go through here because you know the world we live in, we've got to be really yeah. careful how we match this up. So, you know, and there's, there's so there's a there's a strong process behind all this to make sure that um, you know, the men are doing it for all the right reasons. Um, so, um, but yeah, if there's people out there, because we've got more little buddies than we've got big buddies, so if we can get more to match up, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on, on one of the comments you, you made about how <coughs> much you loved it that Ryan still has his high school friends and, yeah. and those that interacted with him. Um, because I want to talk about your friendships and, mm-hmm. and one of them going back to February 1976. Yeah. Auckland Grammar School, Two third formers start mm. their journey together. Mm. You and Sir Martin Crow. Yeah, uh, take us back to the start of that journey. How quickly did you and Martin hit it off in third form? Oh, really quickly. Because I mean, he lived in Tatarangi, but I came from um, a, a place called Wotu, which is a little. Um, uh, Wotu was a garage and a school. We lived a mile from it, and it was nine miles out of Pataru. 
which was a sort of service town for, you know, the timber mill there. But like between Potato uh, and Tiro or p- uh, No, the other way. Yeah, uh, well, no, not even quite. You could go the back way to Tokoroa, but um, it was just nine miles out. Right. So if you went straight ahead out of Potato, you'd go to Arapuni. We just turned left and wandered up, wandered up that way nine miles out of Potato. And so, you know, and we're brought up on a, on, a, on a sheep farm. And so I went on grammar school when it was 1,200 kids. It's bigger now. And I knew one boy, and it wasn't Martin. How many times had you been to Auckland before going to the school? Uh, I can remember going to uh, the Scotland test in 1975, that waterlog one. Outside that, I can't remember going, to be perfectly honest. So, um, And so it was daunting for me. Um, um, but, you know, sitting beside a kindred spirit um, with, a, with a, a very a strong interest in sport. Um, and we just hit it off, right? Um, and we just kept hitting it off. Um, and... You know, we developed this great... I'd go and stay at um, his mum and dad's place because you'd get about four weekends out of term. So m- most of those weekends were... Most of them at Martin's mum and dad's place, Dave and Audrey, um, out at Titarangi. And we used to get in this little car called the Flea, which was a little Toyota 800. That's all it had in it with a muffler on top because his dad was <laughs> into... God's sake. Anyway, I don't know how that bloody thing went. But... Um, and we just... You know, we would play games of uh, cricket with dice... We would play cricket with a little miniature bat and a squash ball in the hallway. It was always about cricket with Martin, obviously. And I love my cricket. Um, and I played first 11 a little bit with Martin at school. But we just developed this incredibly competitive, this friendship. But we were incredibly competitive. We played school you know, tennis doubles together at school. We never played singles. We just played doubles. I think Marty at one stage was the school squash champ. I mean, this man was incredibly talented. Um, and, you know, we got to the end of it, end of our school, school years in the seventh form. And we had this bet. I don't know if you were, uh, you've got that in your notes. But Marty and I had this bet as to who would play the most test matches for our country in our respective sports. And it was brash, arrogant schoolboys. And he was much more likely to achieve that than me, to be blunt. Um, and in the end, um, you know, we were both lucky enough to, to do that. And Marty played a lot more tests than me. But 77 v 46, yep. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and I can remember, and I'm going to try and not get too emotional here because I'll break down, but... Um, at the end, t- towards when I'd finished, uh, Marty, this function I went to where Marty was doing a book or something, and um, I brought an all-black jersey that I'd signed, and basically, you know, um, you know, Marty, um, you won, right, and presented. But he gave back to me a, um, a pencil drawing of Lords, which was a very special place for him. And it just goes too foxy, we both won. <laughs> It's Marty's memory, sorry. Um, And that hangs at home and has pride of place because he's a good man. I love love the thought that two of New Zealand's greatest sports people can have a friendship like me and Stephen do that is just a normal friendship. You know, because from the outside, you see two people who have achieved these amazing things in sport, but you strip that all away and it's two guys that have been mates since they were 13. Yeah, spending yeah. time with one another and caring for one another. It's yeah, it's, and we enjoy it, but, but, and we both love golf too. We play a lot of golf together. Jesus, that was competitive too. <laughs> he is a good golfer. So Ryan and I competitive. I think Marty and I were worse, <laughs> um, to be honest. But um, and then you know he like he didn't mind a re- he didn't mind a red wine, and I don't mind it either. Um, that's the sad thing is that as we're getting to an uh, our age where you know it was golf was about the only thing we could really do too much of anymore. Um, share each other's company and drink wine. That it just got, you know, that got denied. Um, you know, and Marty, you know, he, um, you know, and, and Lorraine, he had found a soulmate. But I guess it took him a while to find, you know, the absolute right match for him. And he didn't get it. They didn't get enough time together. Um, really sad. Um, but I have, you know, rather than even though I'm emotional and I'm sad about it, I try to dwell on the, all the good stuff because we we had some great times. Forty we years really of friendship. Yeah, right? yeah, we did. I'm interested in, like, you know, New Zealand's best batsman, third and fourth and fifth form Martin Crow. Mm. Is he is he created this image? Uh, are people at school taking notice that this kid is going to be a real deal? Like, do you remember watching him? In oh, cricket was phenomenal. Um, I think in the fourth form they went. He was in the first eleven. In the fourth form, could have even been the third form. They played at Christchurch Boys High, and he scored 190 odd as a fourth former down in Christchurch. And it's like it was pretty apparent he had he had immense talent. And I can I can remember um, in my I'm pretty sure it was my seventh form year might have been my sixth form year can't exactly remember, and on a Friday night 
after school, Marty would go for batting practice and I was the fodder who had to chuck the ball, <laughs> bowl it, whatever. Um, I don't think I got a bat. And it was just Marty preparing. And in the space of three weekends, and I won't remember the exact detail of this, um, and I'm not sure, and we were playing men's against men's senior A team because we had a men's A side because we had a, a pretty useful first 11 cricket side. Marty got 240 odd, and the next week got a fifer, and the next week got 140 odd or something in three weekends. I mean, phew, wow, because he, he he wasn't a bad bowler either. Um, yeah, he was. Yeah, it was very apparent to me that he was going to be a cricketing genius. And as you guys both rise to the top in your respective fields, are you always watching when you can his games and yep. is he coming to watch you? Always following. I mean, you know, as, as you get older and your own lives sort of take over and you get busy, you see each other less and less. But that doesn't change the friendship at all. It just means you have a little bit less contact. So the time you're together is almost that little bit more special. And often those times together were over, you know, a game of golf and, you know, um, a, shared gla- you know a glass of wine afterwards. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, but uh, we, we talked about Martin Crowe as a genius. He wasn't yeah. just a genius sportsman, though, as well, right? Like, he revolutionised a lot Cricket of, Max. A lot well, of so broadcast he, it, it stuff. Was, well, yeah, I mean, Cricket Max was his invention. That yeah. In a funny way now, it's probably T20, isn't 100%. it? 100%. So he was always thinking of um, um, ways, the sport that he was deeply passionate about is how can we get this better? How Because, you know, when he started to work, I guess for Sky behind, you know, not only in front of the camera but behind the scenes, it's like, well, how do we make this better? Well, you know, how does this appeal to the audience? How do we grow and make this game more interesting? And look, he was the guy who got actually first in rugby on television on Sky. That's it, what I was going to. He did that. Yeah, that was a point I was going to make. That. He understood. Yeah. The, he understood the, it. The passion that, yeah. that people have for their school, yep. their secondary school, and they want to see it. Oh yeah, to, to give you an idea. I mean, this may not be well known, but Marty oh, clearly he was a genius cricketer, but he also played first eleven soccer at school. And then at the end of the sixth form, he said, oh, I'll play rugby. The next year, he's in the first team rugby team and scored a bucket load of tries. We had this little bit of almost ESP going. Because he was a big man at school, man. He's six foot two and, you know, he was, he was quick and competitive. And, you know, we had these little things about calls would go down the blind side in the days where I was a much more effective runner than I was <laughs> as I got older. And, and, you know, we won a championship that year and Marty scored a bucket load of tries. So, um, you Did know, you used he, to do the old cross kick, if I read that right? Oh, more actually go down the blind side. Right. You know, we, oh, what was called the wipers kick. Yeah, a little bit, but usually maybe down the blind side and chip or grub or something in behind because Marty's innate ability to see where space was and get his timing right to chase something through um, or run onto a short pass or drift out onto a wider pass. He's just... You know, I mean, you can see how his hand-eye was, you have to be to play at the level he had. And so he had, he almost had that in rugby. He could see it, you know, that it's very, very quickly. I love thinking that maybe there was a teacher at Auckland Grammar that realised what they had. These two two little mates who were just like best friends. One would go on to be one of the greatest all-black number 10s and one would be, go on to be the greatest cricketer. Like, just to know that, that sh- these two have actually got something think, something a little bit different. You think Mr Tucker thought that about us <laughs> when, we, when we were sitting at Hamilton Boys uh, yeah. in tutor class? <laughs> Maybe. Sure yeah, I don't know. Class. Actually, a guy to ask that might be, there's a guy called Roger Moses who um, mm. taught us English at school and then went on to become the um, at Wellington College who was the head man. And there's still, you know, there's been a little bit of contact over this long period of time with Roger. And he might, might be one who saw that. Um, maybe. I mean, I remember a guy, Jock Bracewell, mass teacher at school, um, revered at Alton Grammar School. I mean, the guy had a massive influence on Martin and me was John Graham. Mm. No mm. question. You know, that, that, that I mean, Auckland Grammar and all its history's only had about six headmasters, I think. Bugger all. Mm. Over a 150 year history mm. or something. It's ridiculous how. And they take a lot of time to make decisions about who's right and then they, let the, they leave the leader there for a long time. And John Graham led for a long time, and he was a massive influence on both of us. You know, just the man he was. But you know, he was a he was very uh, he was a compassionate man, but a very very strict man in terms of boundaries and expectations. And he had a really nice way about knowing when to kick out the bum, and actually give you a little bit of or give you a bit of a motivational talk, or even almost give you a little bit of a cuddle. He was he was he was a great man, John Graham. Mm. We're so similar that um, those. You know, you, you talk to Ryan about the importance of those high school friendships. Uh, the way mm. you talk about Martin and that sort of those formulative years that making you the person you are. Like, it's so important, isn't it? Those, it those is. I mean, we, we have. I mean, the Orton Grammar teams, first of things we played in. Um, you know, we've had um, 
um, reunions every 10 years. So we had a 40th one recently. Now, not quite everyone made it, but, you know, at the end of last year we got, got together and had um, and a mate who, who um, owns restaurants. was. We just went to one of his places and some guys came from around the country and some who were overseas couldn't make it, but we just got to get together. Graham Henry was that coach, our manager's... You know, still with us. He he helped organise the whole thing. Alan Four, because I went to Forley. I was the captain of the team. You know, we sort of had a twenty, a twenty-five, a thirty, and a forty. Mm. So it's neat that we've so most of us are. Uh, you know, we still know each other. We're not necessarily that connected because we've all got our own things we're doing in life. But when we get together, it's you know, it's not hard to go back and reminisce. I'm quite interested. It's it's not exactly the same parallel, but again, in researching the pod, we both watched the Grant Fox. This is your life. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea no. in that room no. that Bob Parker was going to come in with no. the book? No, not at all. Amazing. No, not at all. I mean, my parents knew, my wife's parents knew, my wife and Ryan knew he was very young. And I, got, I found this out afterwards that, that they were promoting this. And obviously there was a lot of work going on behind the scenes, unbeknown to me. And every time there was an ad came on tally as they were building up to this, right, Adele would go and change the channel. <laughs> at home because he, she was worried that Ryan had blurted something out <laughs> uh, and Ryan would have only been when was that we did that in 94, 94. Eh? so Ryan would have been um, six maybe getting close to seven so yeah um, for those that don't know this is your life so so you all gather in this big sort of room and there's there's celebrities and high profile athletes everywhere right so it's no one knows who it's going to be and it's going to be this big presentation. Mm. So you're sitting there and he sort of starts, well, I was watching the video last night too and he starts walking around the table and he's teasing a few and then he sort of lingers over you and then you're like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> does that go, does <laughs> This that, is going to be a big night for me. Does that go out live? <laughs> yeah, I think it does go live. Um, I, and I think that was wrapped around an Auckland rugby dinner or something, wasn't it? That was the smoke yes. screen for it all. Um, yeah, and you don't, you know, and then you sort of, be, then all of a sudden it's a This Is Your Life production. So they didn't know till we got there. Maybe some other people around Norton Rugby knew, but I certainly didn't. And then all of a sudden, Bob appears beside you, yeah. and you are the subject. So it was, yeah, it was. Um, that must be a pretty surreal and almost overwhelming experience to have that kind of dropped on you when you're and all your best mates flying in from all over the world, yeah. right? They, they fought mm. in Australia and England. Yeah, and Alan Dale. Remember the actor? Um, yeah. I'd had yeah. an interaction with Alan over yeah. too much grog, and um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, on reflection, that was you know very. It was cool. It was cool, and. Very privileged because not many people get Into get a program year, like right? that. Yeah. So, um, in fact, we had a function not that long ago with a whole lot of, of younger generation around. It was at home, must have been oh, just a few years ago, and and there's still a probably a video a VHS tape, and it came out. Actually, no, I know what it was. It was around my parents' 60th wedding anniversary, and so I had the rest of the younger family around, and had somehow over too much wine later on. This came out at night. Yeah. So it was quite nice to see the nephews and all that, who, um, you know, sitting around having a squiz at that. The, the last scene on that is brilliant. It's Ryan in an All Blacks kit at Eden Park oh, yeah. kicking goals. You know, it's like for who he is now, it's so cool to have that sort of... He used to love it. And the days you could run on the field afterwards. Oh, how good were those days? <laughs> um, and even they come, there was just, you know, the All Black thing. Yes, they were talking to um, Ronnie Clark. And um, we just got talking about Ryan, but um, and, and 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 this again in reflection with about Inga, um, because Ryan used to come to the dressing room, and the guy used to run to all the time before me was Inga, you know this guy that's always happy, always had a big smile on his face, and Ryan would just make a beeline for Inga, um, and so he was a, a regular feature, as some of the other kids were in the dressing room too after games. So yeah, memories like that are pretty cool. You talk about just a, a, an Inga, um, uh, what do you call Segway? it? Segway. <laughs> I didn't realise, but as a, as a Pacific Islander, someone growing mm. up of colour, I didn't realise the impact that his passing kind of actually had on mm. on me. Like he mm. was the first person I remember seeing in an all black shirt that looked like me. Yeah, and I was like, man, he's amazing. Mm. And then when he when he passed, I was so yeah upset by that. Yeah, which is quite a contradiction to as you said now when you name an all black squad, it's a very different composition to what it was. Yes, it is. In, yeah, in very the, different. In the nineties. Yeah, and and look. Um, I, if someone had asked me a question, and, and I've said this enough times, maybe not so much publicly, but if anyone says to me, how many from the Crusaders or the Blues or whatever, well, I can't tell you, because we never consider that. And they might say, well, how many from Fiji or Samoa time? Or how many Māori? Can't tell you. Don't know. Because it's not how we look at it. Mm. We just look at talent and what we think we need for our group, and we pick on that basis. Don't care. None of the other stuff counts. Mm. Um but what was, um, I mean, we, we had the privilege of going to see Inga lying in his casket, a, gr a group of us. Um, and it was very emotional, but also very humbling to see 
um, the Pacific Island way of doing things with people around and the casket open. Um, sad, but but a, but in, in, in an ironic way, a real privilege. Um, and he looked, God, he looked good, even though he wasn't with us anymore. Just really sad that he'd had his health battles. God, we're talking about yeah, these well, things a bit much, aren't we? But, you know, he'd had his health battles, and he was really starting to fix all of that, and he didn't get to live it. Mm. Very sad. Mm. Yeah, I remember I was really affected by it. it was, mm. um, it, and it just goes back to that that childhood heroes and those role models and those those influences. Yeah, that, I know. That you it's, had so, up. it's also a time to remind you got to live life, eh? You know, it's like if someone says, "Oh, what about this?" Oh, I'm not sure. Just do it, yeah. Because you just, sadly you just don't know what's around the corner. Mm. You know, I mean, Warney passed away recently. He's a good mate of Ryan's. Yeah, you know that really affected Ryan. Um, it's affected a lot of people around the world. So just it's just a reminder that you know, life's short sometimes, too short. So just live it. But thank you for being so open about the stuff, by the way. This is a really cool conversation to be in. Um, the other friend I want to talk about friendships, mm. we close that loop, is JK, the guy yeah. that just, uh, <laughs> yeah. called, just yeah. put up your phone before. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that relationship dynamic, you know, you're playing together and then you become an all-black selector and mm -hmm. he becomes a pundit. And mm -hmm. at times, his job is to perhaps yeah. pick away at what decisions you've made. Like, How's that dynamic behind the scenes? That's you, fine. I think that's why he was ringing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, get some, gotta get some content for the breakdown tonight. Uh, JK and I talk a lot. Um, and look, we, we are brutally honest with each other. You know, we can argue cats and dogs, and it does not affect our relationship one bit because we appreciate our honesty. Um, and this goes back to when we were playing. You know, JK's answer to, to problems on the foot of the field was, give me the ball. My answer most of the time was, no. You know, give me the ball, no. You know, Joe standing. No, no, I didn't have neck problems like <laughs> looking at this. Or Joe would just say, "Give me the ball," um, and so this just goes back to you know a desire. We were competitive. We wanted we wanted to push ourselves to be the best we could be. We wanted the team to be the best it could be, and you know JK's uh, belief in his ability just and and his talent. Well, give him the ball. You know, little did we know what was going on behind the scenes because we didn't know. That came out. That came out late, and we talk about that a lot, a lot now. But we've remained. He's got a place at Waiy Beach. Had one there a long time. We bought 15 years ago. So, I talked to him a lot on the phone. I see him a lot. You know, the the punditry thing sometimes is a you know a conversation. Can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> um, or um, you know, what's that about? And we can just be on. We don't have to agree. We've always had this philosophy: is that we don't have to agree, but we tell each other we love each other when we finish a, a, a debate. And we don't debate very often, but. I just love the fact you can be brutally honest with a mate and it has no effect at all. Mm. But in many ways, it's, it, it, it keeps us close. After you've finished listening to this, go and listen to the Sir John Kuhn episode because it's two hours and it's one of our favourites. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Um, and I always talk to people. I say, he, he's, he's basically been the top of his field in three different fields. He's been one of our greatest ever All Blacks. He's done more for mental health mm -hmm. than, than perhaps anyone in New Zealand, in the male areas, yeah. certainly. Uh, and he's probably our best rugby pundit. So he's like he's mastered these three fields. But I'm interested in his mental health, which he, he shared a lot with us on that yeah. journey. You were obviously close to it. You yeah. knew. No, I didn't know. You didn't know. No, no, I didn't know. Um, and because I guess it's not. So, and he and I mean, I saw something recently where he said that, you know, did your mates know? No. And they pissed off me because they didn't tell me. He d I didn't tell them. And we I didn't know. You know, it's only when he came out afterwards um, and I think, you know, was it All Blacks Don't Cry? Mm. Um, it's all only became then. Uh, but I, I've got this enduring memory about the mental health uh, because he's been rewarded. His, his nod is about services to mental health, not rugby. Rugby might be part of it, but it's to mental health. And he deserve, he absolutely deserves that. So at, at Waihi Beach, there's a surf club, which you know, beach communities have. And the, the chair lady of the surf club came to me relatively early on, oh, no, about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, saying, you know, would you mind um, you know, helping? We want to get some fundraising going. We can't get everything we need. Can you come and help us with this event and maybe speak at I said, yeah, but I said, um, me alone won't be enough, right? Um, let me talk to my mate. And so I spoke to JK. He'd just become blues coach. Um, and, we, and he said, yeah, mate, I'll help. Um, so we've just started this little thing down there. And the first function we had, I said to Donna, uh, the, chair, the chair lady, I said, Donna, we need an MC. We need it set up because I said, I don't speak. I'll do, I'll do Q&As and JK's a busy man. She said, yeah, everything. Well, we turn up, the MC's not there. 
no MC. JK arrives in his blues gear. This is Chief's country, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is Chief's country. <laughs> and he arrives, and JK, and I told JK, and he said, mate, leave it to me. He's so good at this. And he stood up at the front and he said, got my uniform? <laughs> well, they pissed themselves, right? <laughs> and he had them right from the start. Yeah. And anyway, so he sort of ran it for us, and we did just Q&A off the floor for 40 minutes, and it was all rugby. And then we had a little break, because people are imbibing it, have a, a little a little um, toilet stop, came back. The next 40 minutes or so with mental health, because that's where it started. You could have heard a pin drop. I never said a word for 40 minutes, because I couldn't answer any of the questions. JK in this room was beasts. He was phenomenal. Um, and But but what was great about it is that the, the people that was coming from were men. Mm. He actually, he it's okay for men to be vulnerable. Now, before JK brought this out, we are you know, stoic. Now he's made it okay for men to be vulnerable and talk about this. So we talk about this a lot in the All Blacks, about being vulnerable. Because yeah, because man, we can't help you if you're not, vulner if you're not vulnerable. Um, he's impressive when he, when he does this stuff, and he is deeply, deeply passionate about it. And, you know, we've had our, our own chats about things, and, and something I'd never considered about how, I was told you I was very routine-based, so I do have these routines. But JK said, it's actually feeding your mental health. I never even bloody looked at it like that. Mm. He said, so what do you do in the morning? I said, to get up and walk the dog, or the dogs. Um, and he said, well, that's feeding your mental health. He said, how do you feel if you don't do it? I said, I'm pissed off. I said, I I'm spending the rest of the day trying to work out when I'm going to do it, because I want to do it. Because I miss a day, I don't like it. He said, so, and he said, where are you now? I said, I'm, I'm just stopping at my cafe for my morning coffee. He said, that's, again, I said, this is my routine. He said, no, mate, this is actually how you feel. Hadn't even thought of it mm. like that. Um, but that comes to my, you know, the way I work. It's I talked about not wanting to pro procrastinate in that and wanting to get things done. So it, it's because I'm routine based, I want to. It's not, I just, I'll miss that, doesn't matter, I'll do it tomorrow. No, I actually missed it. How am I going to do this? Mm. Pissing down in the morning, I can't get out. It's too wet to walk the dogs. When am I going to do this? Take my walking gear to work, can't walk the dog. Do I do it later on? Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible affliction to have in some ways, but in its own funny way, it feeds my mental health and I hadn't you know, I just call it routine and he, he gave me he, he just put a different lens on it mm. it was an interesting way of looking at it yeah the, the second half of the episode like you say you could hear it a pin drop we, we were just listening we, you know it's stuff that perhaps as <coughs> men we're hearing more now yep. but perhaps hadn't heard so much in the past and, and just in this podcast the yep. amount of male guests in particular that have been more vulnerable and be yep. more open with it yeah. is JK's just, made that yeah, made that yeah, okay it isn't it? it's he's made it okay 100%. it's, it's yeah. cool Cool. Mm. Um, you, you spoke about so one of the, the other videos we watched was the the good, the bad, and the rugby, yeah. which uh, JK was yeah, you know with Rick Salitzo. With Rick Salitzo, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, those are great. Yeah, by the way, yeah. Those, yeah. Those there was four so iterations: good. one, the good, the bad, and the rugby. The day of the tackle, blood, sweat, and touring. Blood, sweat, and touring. One was called the Wiley Bunch or something. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Only or four of them. I think they got worse as they went on. You ever watched uh, them back? Like no, recently? I haven't. I, I sort of watched them at the time, but oh, they were some of the stuff on there yeah. was funny, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. some well, of it stood the test of time. I, yeah. I still think they're a good watch. Yeah. Well, I can remember. Oh, this is going to sound terrible to the way the rugby culture used to be. <laughs> but when I was helping out on the Blues many years ago, and one Saturday morning we were staying at a hotel near Avondale, and went get out of the hotel on match day morning, go for a little walk through and a coffee somewhere, and on the. Um, on the bus, they were showing one of these videos from one of this, one of these tours. And as I got off the bus, one of the players came up to me and said, "Geez, you guys drank a lot of piss, didn't you?" <laughs> <laughs> but, that, thought, uh, but it's just the way it was. I've said this to They're a number of people. Just the way it was. Yeah. It's the moment. It's a moment when yeah. they reflect on something that's happened in the past. It was a moment in time. Yeah. It hasn't. Maybe it hasn't aged. Oop, hasn't yeah. aged that well. No. But it was. A, it was yeah. a moment in time. Yeah. And yeah. the hijinks, like the, the little skits that you would film on tours, oh. were great. Yeah. So, and anyone that's been on a tour, yeah. they know how boring they can be. So you have to make your own. Yeah, fun. well, they did, and we had some guys who just, you know, I mean, what are they going to do? Line their room and go stir crazy, or actually, you know, I mean, we had a committee structure and guys were responsible for different things and gave them a focus outside footy and a responsibility to the group, um, and you were expected to, you know, to actually <laughs> do your job uh, outside of playing footy. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, they were. They, we had some fun times. Are there elements of that now? On all black. Oh, it's very different now. now. Um, I mean, I don't tour with the boys and then not have and haven't done that as a selector. But you know, it's it's you know this is what they do for a living now. We, we were still in the amateur day, so um, you know the, there is um, a lot of you know with technology, there's a lot of much more homework being done because it's available. Computers, technology, iPads, iPhones, all this sort of stuff. 
Um, you know, and and um, and so very dedicated in that regard. They understand their body a lot more than we did. Understand nutrition and beverages and all of that sort of stuff. What you got to do to get your asset to function to the best of its ability, and that's not just your physical assets, you know, your brain as well. Um, they un- they understand all this much better than we did. Um, you know, they don't have some of the real life experiences in a job that we we had, so to speak. So they get a lot of these skills in that rugby environment. Um, but also with media. You know, we would have been in trouble every. We'd have been on the front pages probably every day of the bloody week. Um, you know, with social media nowadays, you, these guys that can't. You know, even if they don't put a foot wrong, but someone wants to do something, it's just yeah. out there, and you're guilty before you're proven innocent in the world we live in today. Sadly, that's what I think anyway. It's like, man, we're quick to judge, and sometimes there's not context to it. So the guys have just got to. You know, that we are. You know, the, look, the guys. Not everyone drinks, but at the right time, the guys still enjoy a beer. Um, very, very rarely to excess, but it, you've also got to celebrate. Mm. You know, when these guys operate in a very high pressure environment, lots of people do, um, but lots of people at the end of the week go out for staff drinks. That's their decompression. Well, our guys should be allowed to do that after a, a, a big test, shouldn't they? Absolutely. What, what's different? Yeah. Not really, is it? So It's one of those sort of legends of amateur sport that you don't really have a good team culture until you have a huge night out together and everyone comes together well there's been some bond (laughs) (laughs) been part of the odd bonding session around that so also the next day is not easy when you go to training but anyway i was wondering what that is now in the professional environment is it a night at the bowling lanes or something well be swimming pools Mm. um so i'd love to talk about the rugby's transition into professionalism and i think perhaps a good place to start would be the 1987 world cup yeah and my understanding, you know, I was two at the time, so it's all sort of looking back, is that the tournament kind of was half-filled stadiums and the public weren't really sure about it when it started. Mm-hmm. And maybe JK's try yeah. against Italy yep. set things off and by the end it was, yeah. a, it was a juggernaut. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my memories are very similar. I mean, I think from the start, there's a number of the unions up north didn't want this. All right? It was a real battle from... A, you know, a group of Southern Hemisphere and trying to get someone from up north to get the numbers to support it. I don't know enough of the background, but something like that happened. Um, finally got off the ground, and then, I mean, we played Italy. It was a Friday. I think it was the 20th of May. Um, someone will prove me wrong here, and I think it was a Friday again. Someone will prove me wrong. But And we were, we were you know, stumbling along. Uh, Eden Park was only half full. You're right. Um, and the first try was a penalty try. And then I think Michael Jones scored the first real try. Um, but I do generally think the thing that lit that tournament up was that try that JK scored. Um, that all of a sudden, and then we turned off and we beat Italy heavily and, you know, we got on a bit of a roll. And this just this thing just built and built and built to the point where, you know, we had some, um, you know, I think stadiums mostly full, some incredibly good games. And when that France-Australia semi-final at Concord Oval in Sydney was as just about as good of a game of rugby as you'll see, I reckon. Um, because Australia, I guess, were expected to win and France won, so we had them in the final. And, you know, and then a full Eden Park, um, Saturday the 20th of June. Um, ironically, Ryan's wife's birthday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the day, actually, she was born that day. Yeah, well, right. As I understand, yeah. So, yeah, it's a little bit of irony there in that regard, but um, I don't even know if that's the right word. But, um, yeah, so it built and built, and look at it now. And it's a big, big event, logistically, and it's a, it's a key revenue driver for world rugby. To underpin its four-year so I've got to help try to go, try try to keep growing and developing the game. Mm. That's why you heard who was it recently? Was it um, someone suggested that it might be hard for us in the future to ever host this again, mm. simply because of the the key the importance of driving the revenue that in our little old market's going to be hard. And you go to the big markets in Europe, man, they can you know that they, they drive some revenue out of that. Mm. Y- you talk about little old markets now. Yeah. I love the thought of. Little old market in 1987 when you're staying at the Ponamu over the <laughs> yeah, 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 over yeah, the yeah. North Shore. Yeah, like yeah. you compare the hotels <laughs> that the All Blacks stay in now yeah. to anyone who knows the Po. Yeah, that's where you stayed, right? Yeah, but we didn't know any different. Yeah, but we didn't know any different. Po was great, you know. Swassy, the manager, we may we were well looked after. <laughs> so, I mean, there's there was we didn't know any different, right? Um, and so you know, it, yes, it's changed, you know. And the boys, the, the Park Hyatt's the latest one they're in, pretty flash hotel. But that, you know, that's um, that's just, that's the world they live in now. But am I right in thinking, and I think I've heard you retell this, that when you left on the morning of, or, or yeah. to prepare for the, it was the first time that you kind of been, had fans Yeah, at first the time I can remember uh, fans standing up in, in numbers, like, you know, a couple of hundred or so, outside the hotel waiting to see the bus off. 
the first time I can remember that happening, right? And then the drive to the ground was pretty nuts too, um, to be honest. So, um, I mean, did you have a sense of occasion at, at that time? It was the first Rugby World Cup final. Yeah, well, no, we did. I mean, it, it, it had been it had been growing, um, and it was interesting because I don't. This is, story's been told enough, but you know, Brian Lahore, um, rest his soul, was was our coach, and he, you know, we did well early. And BJ didn't want us to get ahead of ourselves. So after we played Argentina and Wellington at the end of pool play, where do we go? Up to a little, oh, actually might have been before RJ Khan, does that remember? A little place called Piranoa, which is in the Wairapa, not far from where he lives. Just wanted to ground us, make sure. So we went into this little community, got billeted. Oh, got really? Billeted. No, I doubt. Got billeted, <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure I was with Wayne Shelford. Um, and just got billeted, you know, and it's just so. That's amazing. Yeah, that was incredible. So the guy, you know, we just. Arrived at this community hall, massive gathering, right? And um, all of a sudden, up on stage, this family. That is so cool. Yeah. It's yeah. just <laughs> BJ. Had this great feel for, and you know, if, so if we were getting a bit ahead of ourselves, he was going to make sure we didn't. Um, Susan, so. Dame Susan Devoy told a story of getting billeted at a squash tournament in Adelaide. Oh, really? And there was an outhouse, and she had to take a piss in the trophy that she'd oh. won. No <laughs> similar stories in the wire. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine Susan telling that story <laughs> unashamedly. God. We need to bring back yeah, the billeting system. Yeah, yeah I think we yeah. should. Yeah, no, he is in graces with Dame Susan. Um, um, no, I can't. Look, there, there probably was. I mean, um, Jake Age probably got some stories about because he, you know, he was a butcher, but I don't think he knew about farming life. Yeah. <laughs> so it would have been interesting to, for him. But yeah, I mean, that was just we had a great time. Um, but they were those times. That was then. This is now. The, the jobs on the side is interesting. So you retired from rugby in '93. Yeah. Yep. Rugby didn't go professional till '95. Yeah. So through your whole career, what, what does that look like? Are you making mon- good money no, from no, the game? No, we, we, no, no, no. We, we got a, a um, we we got a daily allowance, right? Which I mean, I think by the time we finished, it was sixty dollars a day. It was paid in cash. Wow. Um, and it was really just an an, an allowance. Um, and to be fair, couldn't spend it. So most of the time it got bought home and, you know, it was an envelope of cash for Adelda. Some of the boys probably spent them. I mean, if we went out, we had to pay our own bills for the most part. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, look, we, we didn't want for anything. You know, airfares, accommodation, meals, well, all of that covered. Um, the daily allowance was probably just for our own entertainment. And sometimes, and look, there were card schools. It's a card school on the team. Yeah. Um, and on bus travel days, and we had a few of them in those days, the card school would get going, and that's where that money would change hands. Uh, I didn't engage in the card school. Card school I'm not a gambler. but um, So that was it. So payment, yeah, in a, in a way, in a funny way it was. But it was, it was um, um, in those days, we called that money cabbage. I don't know why, but it was called cabbage. Um, and it was just a daily allowance. So that was it. One. But we but we didn't know any better. We didn't know any better, so we weren't worried about not getting paid or anything. We just didn't know any better. Mm. One of the the well known stories, I guess, about your career is the um, didn't score a try, but the, the one against Ireland, right, where you you've scored mm. but, uh, scored a try, scored a try a year later, right? I did. Yeah, yeah. you did score a try, mm. but the first try was disallowed. The first try was against Ireland mm-hmm. when uh, and and there's this like, it was in the. Um, the good, the bad, and the rugby. So there's a little ball boy, right? Mm-hmm. He like flags. Mm-hmm. The, he goes into the field and he gets the ref's attention. That I think Fitzy had put his foot over touch yep. to, yep. to take it away from you, and the crowd goes crazy mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. Is that a strong? Is that is that a strong memory for you? No, I remember it. Um, I just I do remember. He came on the field. I was going to get rubbed out. There's something going on here. I didn't know what it was. Um, and and I don't remember having any particular emotion about it because it, not scoring a try didn't didn't particularly bother me um, at all. It was I was happy if the team was winning and the guys around me were scoring tries and I was parting a help part of helping call a shot that helped created that maybe. Um, so didn't that, that didn't bother me. Um, but you know Jim Fleming was the touch judge and Sandy McNeil was a referee. And um, you know I mean every time I see Fitzy, which is not that often nowadays, but he does get reminded of it and. I don't have to buy beer when I'm with them. Yeah. <laughs> was that was that more a public thing about the try scoring than it was a team thing? Because that's kind of oh no, yeah, of course it would have been because I didn't score a try. You know how the media worked; they wanted to play on yeah, this, this little thing. <laughs> so um, and so no, it was not not the team might have had some fun afterwards. I can't quite, I can't quite remember, but um, and, you know we we I can remember. Oh, I'm probably there's a bits of the story, but uh, but you know we had official test dinners after games, and so we went back to the hotel that where that dinner was and Fitzy come with me so I had to stay with Fitzy all night 
And but but prior to the dinner, then I think the dinner was um, had to get in the lift to go upstairs, or we could go up some stairs to get to where the dinner level was. But we'd assembled downstairs, and Fitzy wouldn't let me go, and we were sort of pretty last to leave to go to the dinner. And we got in the, got in the lift to go up, and he opened the lift. There's Jim Fleming, <laughs> who was the touch judge who had flagged it. So Lim and Fitzy gives him, gives him a stern look, and then smiles and puts his hand and shakes his hand because Jim would have thought, uh oh. Anyway, um, just a funny little little side story to that. But nowadays, it's, I've, ne- I've never seen that pulled up since then, before then or since then. But but I did score a try in my very next Test match. Oh right, yeah. That that kind of old school, those old school values, the kind of the the hierarchy, the bus hierarchy, those sorts of things. Yeah. You think they still have a place in the game now? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Because I think there's some traditions that are cool that shouldn't, you don't really want to die out. So the guys still have their seats on the bus. There's still, to some degree, a hierarchy on the bus. But the bus trips, are, they're, you know, these guys don't go from point A to point B on the bus. It's, tra- it's a training exercise or an airport exercise. It's not going from Dublin to Connacht, mm. right? Mm. Where it's an all day Sunday drive or four or five hours with a stop at Munster for bloody lunch on the way. And Sunday was a drinking day. So you can imagine what the bus trip was like. And we played on the Saturday, and Saturday night's a drinking night. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that was just the times we were in. Um, so, you know, there was... I don't know, the guys have different you know, committees and, 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 um, and, and structures around what they do nowadays. But, you know, we had, we had committees to do all sorts of things. I mean, at one stage, I was on the laundry committee. And you know, your job was to find lost laundry. The guys' gear was all numbered, and, that, and if, any, if someone lost something, they had to come to you and say... You know, I've lost this. Go and find the bloody thing. Yeah, I think I saw JK yeah. as the baggage controller yeah, yeah, at the yeah. airport yeah. having to make sure that the yeah, suitcases yeah. got yeah, to the right I mean, place. W- w- one year I was the banker, you know, that looked after all the other money from, you know, the the, the other little commercial activities we used to run on the side <laughs> in those days. And I lost the bloody money tin one day. Anyway, that's a long story. It cost me a lot to get it back at the court session that night. But, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we don't have those sorts of committees anymore. But, you know, we still have guys who have a, a sort of, away from the game, duties to perform that, that give them a responsibility to the group. You were a world-class goal kicker, one of the best to ever do it. Are you, do you get annoyed when people talk about like talented players because it's not about talent, it's actually about how much you practice to get that good? Like, is that Were you that good because you put so many hours into practicing that skill? Um, look, I, I enjoyed, always enjoyed the craft of goal kicking. Um, and I think you've got to have almost this... Uh, um, th- this mindset around a-, a dedication to it if you want to be any good at it. Um, and it starts with, it does start with talent, but, um, you know, um, hard work will always be talent if talent doesn't work hard. But if you've got talent and you work hard, and that's, w- that's what sets the best in the world above the others at, at, in sport. They come with an innate talent for a start, but if they don't work hard, the harder worker just underneath them will go past them eventually. But if, you're, if you've got talent who, work, who works hard, man, the world's your oyster. Doesn't matter what you choose to do, and it doesn't just apply to sport. So, um, I mean, I, you know, my father played rugby. He was a goal kicker. He was a torpedo toe hacker. Um, you know, he retired from rugby young to, you know, support kids. I retired from rugby at 31 for a variety of reasons, but one of them was Ryan was six starting to engage in his own, you know, wanted to say that's what I wanted to be there because my parents had been there. Um, um, you know, I used to kick a ball on the front lawn of the farm. You know, with, I used to make little goalposts out of a three by one and two fence battens. And and um, I used to kick toe hack when I was very young. But, you know, a, a wet, a, a, fr- a cold, wet ball in the winter in the Waikato wasn't much fun for a young boy to kick on his toe. Then I saw Barry John and the 71 Lions kick round the corner very successfully. Oh, that won't hurt my toe, and so I, I. That's when I adopted that. I think so. In '71, I was nine, so that's when I adopted that. My father ultimately built me a full-size set of goalposts in the front paddock. I spent hours down there. Yeah. I love kicking a rugby ball. Some will say when I played, I kicked it too much anyway. But um, and I had reasonable hand-eye coordination, but I was a small kid. Um, um, you 72 uh, kgs when you first played. When um, I first played Fortnite, I was 72 kgs. It's so little, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is yeah. now, but yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, maybe it was then. Yeah, no, it was then too. I think <laughs> it was then too. Um, so I, I just, you know, and I worked hard at it, you know, because I wanted to be good at it, and it was, you know, for, it was my job for the team. So I, I put, you know, huge expectations on myself. But again, I had routines around that. Again, come back to that word. I had a weekly routine on tour. It was, 
you know, it could be slightly different than when I was at home and I had to work. I had to, you know, the timing of it was different. But I had this routine, you know, um, match day minus one, i.e. Friday, what I would do. Um, and that never that never changed. It's amazing how similar just hearing you talk about your goal kicking. I'm thinking about Ryan and mm. golf, right? Like yeah, he's avid. He has same the same structures mentality. and routines. Yeah, yeah, yeah they all do. Yeah. They all do. Mm. Can I jump on a point that I was going to make? Right at the end, but you've you've utilised it now, and that was the relationship that you've got with the British and Irish Lions. Because yeah. you mentioned Barry John in 1971 on the yeah. tour, influencing your kicking. Yeah, I think you must be one of the few New Zealand rugby players that have played the Lions, or been involved on two Lions tours, but played the Lions is it four five times? Um, I played the Lions um, one, two, three. I played the Lions four times, right? Um, and so 90, uh, sorry, 1983 was I played was for Auckland. Um, so we played them. Um, Reasonably and then, crucial drop kick that oh you yeah. got. <laughs> um, and then 93, when they toured and I was in the All Blacks and played three tests against them. Right, so four times. You four times as a player. Um, three times with the All Blacks, once for Auckland, and then obviously in 2017 um, with the All Blacks, but as a selector. Because so. one of our early episodes was Dwayne Sweeney, who yes. mentioned how special it was for him to get the opportunity yeah. to play against the Lions. Yeah. Why is it that special for Because it's unique. Players? I only play every four years, it's and it's a unique brand, and you bring those four teams together, you get a useful footy side, um, and that's uniqueness is part of the appeal. So um, and so in your career, if you get to play it once, you're lucky, and that is. I mean, we all like to do things. You know, okay, the stuff you do every day, or every competition you play in, that's your bread and butter. But every now and again, something something different that to get you know get you excited. That's what the Lions bring. Um, and it'll be the same for the guys who get picked to play for the Lions. They don't get to do it very often either. So um, there's a special excitement around it. Um, and, they, and, so, and you only get them once in your own backyard every 12 years now. It used to be a little bit different in the old days, but now it's once every 12 years. Australia, South Africa, um, um, uh, New Zealand, and they don't play in their own backyard. And, and am, am I right in thinking that, that wanting to play the Lions is one of the reasons that you didn't retire after the 91 World Cup when some people thought yeah, you well, might have? Yeah, part of I mean, look, 91 was tough, right? Um, and Gary and I copped a lot of crap afterwards, you know. Um, and, yeah, some of it was deserved. But, you know, I, I mean, when Ryan was saying, because, you know, he wasn't immune to hearing stuff, you know, what's Daddy done wrong? It's, you know, they've gone a bit far, to be honest, because it got personal. Um, and it, you, when you live in that world, you got to accept what goes with it. But just, you know, play the ball, not the man. Um, and and unfortunately, there's still too much of that goes on, in my my opinion. Um, um, social media is a big part of that. But, but that aside, um, I took time to reflect. I was going to retire. I'd had enough. Right? I don't need this shit anymore. Um, and I, you know, I was involved in a business and young family, and it was just time to move on. But I thought, don't make it now while you're emotional. And I don't. I'm not that. Well, I got emotional today, but I'm not usually that prone to it. Um, is just give it some time, let it breathe. And I'm not going to let the naysayers push me out of a game I love. I'll make the decision when I want to go, not then. And as time passed, I thought, you know what? I'm not done yet. I still love this game. I still want to be, I still feel I had a passion for it. I still felt I could play at the highest level. Um, and I wanted to be, you know, I love the teams I played. I, I, I was I was representing. And the Lions was a big part of that, no doubt. The challenge of playing them in an all-black jersey I hadn't had. So that was a big appeal. But my, So my decision to play was I had to commit to two more years, not one, I had to go to two. And if I was good enough to be picked, because that was the challenge at the time. you know. And I didn't get picked initially. Laurie Mange put me in the group, but I didn't play initially. And then eventually I got, you know, I might have played the first one, didn't play very well, then got dropped and then had to fight my way back. Um, and these things all shape you. Um, and I think what happened to me ultimately made me better. And then I got those two years, and then there was a World Cup two years away. But it was, if I had for, to keep committing, I had to go for two more years, or I had to give the All Blacks a chance to find who the next person was. And I mightn't have been at even if I'd chosen to play, because I even said, well, you're past it, time for someone else, and someone else better could have come along. Well, it turned out a guy called Mertens, he wasn't bad, wasn't <laughs> yeah. he? He wasn't bad. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of the yeah, thumbnail sketch of that process I went through to, you know, to, do, I, do I keep playing? Do I, do I retire? Um, you know, eventually I just said, no, I want to keep going. I, I want to link you up to the All Black Selectors role, which sounds to me from the outside like a great gig, and I'm excited to get into <coughs> that. But 
you tried your hand at coaching after yeah. you stopped playing rugby a few yeah. years at Auckland and yeah. realised that it wasn't for you? No, it, it wasn't for me. And I, no, I had no desire to go coaching. To be perfectly honest, I had no desire to go coaching at all. In fact, um, I got shoulder tapped by Jeff Hipkins, who was the NCO of Auckland Rugby, when um, um, the job became available. And he, he rung me up and said, I want you to apply. I said, I don't want to go coach. He said, I want you to apply. And I go, Auckland hadn't been going too well at that point, and it's a union I'm deeply passionate about. And I thought, oh, you know, ego. <laughs> yeah, I can help. I hadn't really thought of it, um, but okay, I'll go along and see what happens. So I went along and presented and thought I did a pretty good, reasonable job in my presentation. And then Jeff rang me up and said, oh, um, you didn't get the job, but we'd like you to assist. I said, oh, who got the job? He said, Wayne Pivak. I didn't really know Wayne. I knew who he was. I didn't really know him. I said, well, I can't commit to that until I spend time with Wayne. I need to understand. So we spent an hour together. It became pretty apparent that we were going to get on just fine and we were very aligned on you know, what we were trying to achieve. So I went into that more, not, not out of any desire to coach, more out of, um, you know, I really want to help Auckland. Mm. And I was flattered to have been asked. So I went into it. And we had five years, you know, and we won one championship in the first three, and then um, and then Graham Henry, um, you know, ended with Wales and came home looking for looking for a job, <laughs> and um, you know um, Wayne was big enough to say, you know, mate, this is not about me, you know, even though we knew how good Ted was, and he'd probably get all the kudos if we went well. Uh, we did go well; we won the next two championships, but you know, it was a great, you know, Ted was a great contributor to that group. And then, you know, in 2002, Peter Sloan um, shoulder tapped me for the, actually, was it two, yeah, 202, with the Blues. And I hadn't considered, uh, but I'd applied for a Blues coaching role because Wayne said, you just got to show them you're ambitious. You won't get it, but show them you're ambitious. I didn't, I thought, oh. Anyway, I did. And, um, and didn't, I, I thought, okay, well, I've done that, but nothing will happen. Then Peter Sloan came to me and said, will you help? It's like, well, geez, I've applied for the job. I've really got to do this. I can't say, well, actually, I didn't do it for that reason because yeah, yeah. I didn't think I'd get it. Um, and I sort of found out at that point, um, I d wasn't really, I did, coaching wasn't for me. And, and it sort of, the best way to explain this was when I, in 2000 and, um, uh, end of 2003, sorry, when did I stop with Auckland? Um, God, 99 to. 2001, 202, 202, 203 was when I stopped with Auckland. I remember walking out in Eden Park with uh, with Graham uh, before we played Northam, which I think was a last round robin game. And I said to Ted, I said, mate, I'm giving this up. Because I'd, I'd had one year with the Blues and stopped. Because that was really hard on the family. It was a rugby road show for seven months, seven days a week. And I, I, was not, I wasn't present at home. And so I told Peter Sloan, I can't do this anymore. And I said, I don't even know that I really like coaching to be honest. Anyway, I did one more year with Auckland because we were committed to it and Auckland was easier because it was just domestic and home without it. It wasn't seven days a week and it wasn't all the travel. And I said to Ted, I, I'm, I'm going to give this up. He said, I'm not surprised. I said, oh, well, I thought he'd try and give me a, <laughs> a chat about staying involved. <laughs> yeah. Oh, why do you say that, Ted? He said, well, in my experience, guys who played at the highest level struggle with coaching because you don't have, you don't feel like you've got the influence you have when you're on the field. And he's dead right. Because that's the bit I didn't like with coaching. You sit up in the box and say, oh, what the fuck are they doing? We didn't train that during the week. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have the same level. When you're on the field, you felt like you could influence it, right? Um, and the coaching box, you everything you do to help the team prepare and then mm -hmm. what will be will be. And sometimes it wasn't always, <laughs> you always get what you want. I really struggled with that. And so the emotional roller coaster, I, that's how I describe it. I didn't, I didn't like it. I had that as a player, but I had an outlet on the field. As a coach, you didn't have an outlet. Right, and and so at the end of it all, you knew why you did it, and when you didn't get what you wanted, so what the hell am I doing this for? Mm. You know, because of that roller coaster. So and I I worked out. I mean, it was a lifestyle I didn't particularly want, um, but I also found out I didn't actually want the roller coaster either. So I um I had five years, and that was the end of it. So then that's <coughs> quite a long break bef before you got picked as an All Black selector. Mm. Were you? Did you have no? No, I did uh, some broadcasting. I got shoulder tapped and did commentary. Did some commentary great. work. Yeah, but right. no coaching. No roles. coaching. No, 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 no official roles. I mean, every yeah. now and again, you'd someone asks you, can you come and you know do a goal kicking this or a goal kicking that or Murray yeah. Mexted's you know uh, rugby academy. Iran's yeah. went and helped down there regularly. You know, love Murray to bits. Had great passion for it. Good thing going. So you'd go and keep your hand in doing that, but no passion to get involved. You know, at a at a professional level anymore. Mm. So the, the All Black selectors thing is quite unique. Uh, it's like to rugby and in league, really, right? Cricket. Like uh, in cricket, yeah. Okay, so not football though. I'm trying to wrap my head around like what 
what the role of the <coughs> selector is? Is it to yeah. challenge the coach? Because in say like the English yeah. football team, you've got a, a huge selection of players, and it's one guy making the yeah. decision, and maybe he's using his assistants to yeah. bounce ideas off. Why is that not the same for the All Blacks? Well, I, I think that for for my role, it, it comes out to what Steve wanted, right? So I, I'd sort of I'd, I'd been doing some broadcasting off and on, or commentary work, and then at 2011 World Cup, I was done. Right, that's it. Time to just get rid of all of this out of my life and. And um, and just leave rugby behind for a little while, right? I'd still be interested in it, but just not be involved in a day to day basis at all. Great Sky Sport ad, by the way, for the um, the oh, 2011 yeah, Rugby no, World no, Cut no. commentary. It's brilliant. <laughs> I'll link I'll link it in the show notes. Thanks it's very a, much. It's amazing. Thanks, Seamus. Um, um, then I got a phone call from Steve. Right, so he's applying for the job. I got a phone call from Steve, and I still remember exactly where I was. I was driving up Bond Street, coming to the lights with Sandringham. Uh, sorry, uh, New North Road at Eden Park. Oxy shag here. Now I didn't know Steve very well, but I'd seen him around the traps and I'd travelling doing commentary work and he was helping helping Graham and Smithy out. And um, you know, he was a he was going to his interview within a few days and he said, Mate, I'd like you to be a selector. And I made a phone call out of the blue. Hadn't contemplated, hadn't thought about it. And straight away it resonated though, because in a way it's a team I love to bits, deeply passionate about. I was again flattered to be asked. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, there's a way I can stay connected, um, and and hopefully contribute, stay connected, but didn't require all the time that coaching did. So I went home and spoke to Adele, and it's like she thought it was pretty cool that you, the team you had played for, um, that I did have a chance to get involved coaching wise, and I won't download that. It was a question Graham asked me, but um, that that I turned down, um, and then you went and got Wayne Smith, which was a much better outcome. Yeah. Um, but that um, uh, I could st I could be involved in without all that time commitment. So he said, you got to do this. So anyway, so um, and Steve defined it like this. He said, I need someone outside the group who's independent who can challenge us. Mm. This is what you said. He said, because we can get, you know, we, we're with these guys a lot. We can get emotionally quite close yep. to them, and we just need to make sure that, that we've got someone, you know, who's challenging us, challenging our thinking, making sure we're not getting too loyal at times. Mm. Right, and as, as tough a man as Steve Hansen comes across, he's a very compassionate man too, right? Um, so um, that was the role. Mm. Still the role that I performed, you know, into my 11th season. So there is, is, is there, I mean, New Zealand cricket adopted that with Gav Larson in a way, you know, I guess when, you know, to exp I think they expanded their selection group and they got someone from an independent point of view who wasn't in the day-to-day -day setup. You know, um, oh, they haven't done bad, have they? The Black Caps. <laughs> so seems like a great gig. It seems like a great gig. You get to watch the rugby. You're you've got yeah, a real but you're voice. Still, you're at the still table. on that roller coaster, though, eh? That's yeah. still the bit that you know. And there's a massive expectation. We get that. We've lived it, right? We get it. Um, but mate, we're 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 not immune to, immune to feeling that criticism when it doesn't when you don't get what you want because you know we all like to be liked, don't we? Yeah. So dealing with that is still something that's not easy sometimes. You know. Um, as I said to you before, someone gets a little bit too personal, and it doesn't. It shouldn't be like that. And I lo look, I love the fact that our rugby fan base is deeply passionate about this team, uh, and they care enough to have an opinion. Right? Let's just make sure that the, we just get the balance right between what is a generally held opinion and a, and a, a, a challenge of, you know, a selection or a thing, and just leave the leave the the, the, the people out of it, mm. and just talk about the job, the role. Just on that point, <coughs> one of my favourite movies of all time is Moneyball. Yep. Billy Bean, yep. selection based on statistical criteria. Yeah. Yep. Has that crept into the role of a selector? Does that is that a consideration? Yeah, it is a consideration. But you know what? If we use stats to select the side, a uh, rugby side, it'd change every week. It would. You know, I mean, I, I can remember um, being told, um, and I look at the stats, but I don't. I don't read a massive amount into them unless we're in a really tight contest with a selection. They'll become a little bit more of a factor that we'll, we'll consider, from my point of view anyway. Um, is um, Going back a little while when we'd first picked Aaron Smith, and it was clear in our mind he was the number one half pick, and I think the rest of the country saw that and, became, and, and you know the, became, became the best nine in the world. Um, is on stats, he was the fifth ranked halfback. If you put all the halfback stats, he was ranked number five. Well, we're not, are we not going to pick Aaron Smith on that basis? It's then you got to say, well, what are their, their stats, um, damn lies and statistics of whatever the saying goes. You've got to be careful how you use them. Mm. They're all there, 
try to make and help shape viewpoints. But but they're not, in my my opinion, something you should rely on to select. Moneyball, different ball, different situation, because that game's in some mm. ways a bit different than our game. But every week it changes. You know, and all that one week might have terrible stats compared to somebody else. Does that mean, and we all, no one likes us changing the team too much nowadays anyway. So if we, if we work it on stats, we're going to change it every bloody week, and it'll change by lots. So, oh yeah. The, the, can, I, can I go one <clears throat> yeah, more? Yeah, go, go. The, the other one I love is the bolter. Yeah. Which doesn't <laughs> really happen all that often anymore. Yeah. But if you do select the bolter as a selection group, are you sort of rubbing your hands like, no. oh, I can't wait for this to drop tomorrow, so the public's going to go cause, mad? Because we don't consider the bolters. Because we've yeah. done all the homework. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. when the public aren't <laughs> yeah. thinking about it because it's not on their that's radar. You, that's yeah. just you, man. You know, look, um, it doesn't mean that the public view at times isn't right, and we might we might be slightly wrong because we're not perfect. We don't get it right all the time. Um, but we've got a lot of information at our disposal that, that you know, when you drill down into something, and we can, and then you might have a discussion with someone in the media off the record about something, and they'll say this. And I said, well, not what you know. We've watched this for weeks and weeks and weeks, and you've seen a snapshot, and you're making a judgment. We've seen all this, and when you challenge, they go, oh yeah, well we don't see it as much as you do. Now, doesn't mean sometimes that they're right, they're not right, and we're right all the time. But all I'm saying is that we've got a lot more information now to dispose of which to drill down and make the decision. And we're the ones charged with that responsibility, and we're judge. Um, and we take that responsibility incredibly seriously um, because we know that you're at the massive expectation. God, the 1905 slash 24 all blacks have got a lot to answer for, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, anyway, um, but it, it is, we, we, we live and breathe that. But as I said, we're not immune to being hurt by, you know, the, the criticism at times because. It's human nature to want to be liked. No one likes hearing bad things said about, you know, the people you're involved with, or yourself, or the, or the, you know, the team. So, um, but you just accept, like it or lump it, it goes with the territory. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bully my way <laughs> for one more, one more solution. Go ahead, man. Yeah, on a roll. Yeah. I'm, and I know, I know this would never happen anymore because of yeah. workloads, etc. But the old probables, possibles game. Can we ever see that come back? Not, again? Well, I don't know where you fit it in the window. Like we, we had a North South recent, you know, when we had a, a less rugby and we had to. You know, uh, there there was a gap that needed to be filled, for commercial reasons too, but also that um, there was a, a, going to be a lack of international rugby on our shores, and it was nice to to run that game out again. Um, when was that? Twenty twenty, wasn't it? Mm. Um, Jeez, but, but, but but look, we uh, that we not often. It's been talked about occasionally, but where do you fit it in the window? Yeah. These guys play arguably too much rugby now, so just where do you where do you put it in the window? I mean, we get we stop Super Rugby this weekend. And we've got two weeks to prepare for, you know, a hell of a test series against Ireland. We get the least preparation of any of, any of the teams that play in competitions. Super Rugby get the best run at it. NPC teams get slightly lesser run at it. And we get next to nothing. Mm. Um, that's why there's a, quite a bit of work done during Super Rugby and a bit of contact. Because it has to be. Because we can't be reasonably expected to just all of a sudden download everything and information overload, right? And within two weeks... Get, turn out 100% performance. It's just not realistic. And we know how we always struggle in the first test anyway as a rule. And a lot of that's just a lack of preparation time. So Joe Schmidt's coming in. You're yep. hanging up the yep. uh, selector's pen. Yep. How does that handover work? Do you sort of download all of your thoughts and feelings on the team? Or F- let Foz know? knows all that anyway and Plum knows all that. So um, whether Joe wants to reach out and chat, look, um, if I go back to how the start, I said goodbye to the team in 2019. Right, I was done, right? Foz did say to me, mate, if I, he was going to apply for the job, if I get the job, will you come with me? And I said, no, mate, I'm done. It had nothing to do with Foz. I love the Manda bits. But it was just time to move on. I thought it was time for the team too. Um, and then, you know, Foz got the job. And, but before it was announced, he rang me and said, mate, I'm the preferred candidate. And, I, and, and he was after Joe, right? But Joe wasn't available. And he said, can you give me a hand for a year, right? Because what he didn't want to do is put a filler in, right? because he was always after Joe, and it wasn't a hard decision to make to say, okay, I'm sort of changing my mind, but I'm flattered again, um, and I love the man, so yeah, and I love the team, so yeah. They turned into two years, because you still couldn't get Joe, and 2020 was a very disrupted year, as we know. So it was, and we were sort of felt like we'd laid, you know, a reasonable groundwork in 2020 that we wanted to carry on. And then late last year, he rings me and said, well, I finally got him, but I can't get him till August. Yeah. <laughs> so I need a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, and so that was the process. Um, and Joe, you know, we didn't know at the time, but he was obviously getting involved with the Blues. 
And the other part is he doesn't want to be involved against Ireland, which we massively respect mm. for the team that he's coached for a long time and deeply passionate about. So he's got him. Uh, he's going to add. He's going to add tremendously to our group because he'll do more than just me. Because I've, you know, I've run a business at the same time I've selected the All Blacks. So you know, always been juggling that time. Um, so that's the that's the process. Joe rang me um, um, when he was going to become available and said, "What does it involve?" So we had a, we had a chat for a long time about you know all of that stuff. Now, if he reaches out and wants another download, fine. I, I mean, I don't think he'll need it. He's got a big rugby brain anyway, yeah. and he'll get all the info from Foz and Plum. So, but so, I'll be very happy to have a cup of coffee if he wants it. It seems like a, a great series to sort of <coughs> end on. It's going to be. It's going to be exciting. This eh? is, look, if you go back, I mean, I'm again eleven seasons, but I can't remember the last time we lost a game in the June window against the Northern Hemisphere team. So someone, I'm mean, someone will know, train spotter will know, but it probably goes back quite a way. Um, but man, this Irish team's seriously good. Mm-hmm. And then we got three against them, and then we got Africa twice in Africa. In my, all my time involved is like that. It's not been this tough a start, yeah. so it's brutal. Mm. Uh, but we have, don't have a choice, <laughs> so yeah. we, we're yeah. going to find out pretty quickly, aren't we? <laughs> so, um, but you know, the guys are excited by the challenge. You know, we know we've got to grow our game. Um, you know, I don't think our game's gone backwards, but I think other teams are coming forward, and and that's good for the game globally. Take your All Black eye patch on. And look at that, you want a test match sitting on the edge of your seat? Well, you're going to get more of them now. But if, if you want to sit on the edge of your seat and, and get the outcome you want all the time, well, you're not, you're not going to the right game. Because mm. they, they call them test matches for a reason. Mm. So I think that's where the balance is. You want to be sitting there not knowing the outcome, but you want your team to win. Well, you can't sit pretty hard to sit in two places at once because I want to be there reclining. Um, it's it's been such an epic chat, and it's gone in so many different directions. It's been great. We haven't even you, you mentioned there your business. Yeah. You know, like we haven't even talked about that, but you've had an incredibly successful business as well while you've been, you know, coaching and selecting <coughs> and things. And yeah. it's Monster Vision, right? That you yeah, Monster Vision's the, the company it trades under. I mean, it goes back, and I mean, I've been involved in this industry for over thirty odd years. Yeah, now, you so would have seen some changes. Yeah, I mean, I look, I um, I used to. Um, when I first got we got married on uh, 9th of March 1985 and um, by October I used to I was working for Adidas which is under the Lane Walker Rudkin banner at that stage I was a sales rep I got made redundant it's like geez I just got married this ain't going to play out too good mm. and it turned out that you know I had an interest of being involved in sport and I can't remember exactly how it happened but there was a guy called Lindsay Singleton who had a company called Harvard Sports Marketing who sort of started out um, in a sort of sports signage rights business, but also managed Jeff Health and Lance, I think Lance Cairns at the time. I knew both Jeff and um, Lance, but um, I found out, and I played cricket against Lindsay in, t- in a Tauranga competition. So I found out, I rang him up and said, mate, I want a job. So in January, uh, January the 6th, 1986, I think it was, I started mm-hmm. with him and involved in sport where we, you know, a, a variety of things, but a lot of it was around signage rights. And, um, you know, all these years later, I eventually got to own the business. It sort of sold a couple of times under different iterations. And then I've merged it with an LED infrastructure business called Monster Vision. Um, but we've got uh, ownership through Australia and that'll be back through um, some ultimate Indian owners as well. So it's a little, it's a, it's a, you know, not so much complicated, but there's a different owner structure when my family trust owned it. But it's been a, it's been a business I've been involved in for a long time. It's been good to, to my family, me and my family. Um, and to be frank, Frank, I don't know what else. I'm not universally qualified, so I don't know what else to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's so a, the easiest way to right. when you turn the tally on, in sport in New Zealand, a lot of variety of sports, and you see um, LED around the edge of the field, um, LED uh, signage on the LED, grass logo, signs up around the grandstand, big screens. You know, we've got, we're involved in, in parts of that all around the country in different codes, and are really sim- and we do concerts and council events and, corporate events and that as well. So, you know, it's an it's a LED infrastructure hire and sales business mm. and merged with what I had, which was ultimately called Carnegie Sports Marketing. And we merged it into that, but trade as a company called Monster Vision. It's been an incredibly full life. And I really, just thinking back, I love how we've got one of the greatest All Blacks of all time. He's done all this stuff, but we spent the first 40 minutes talking about your son. Like, that's a really, really cool thing, I think. And, and some of the themes and some of the... I don't know some of the conversations we've had and the emotion brought out being vulnerable. Yeah. Like it's been, it's been really. You know really what? Cool. I mean, you guys, this this is ahead of you guys now, but we've got grandchildren now. You know, I've been married to Adele for thirty seven years. I'm really proud of that. You know, we've got a great partnership. I got a, we've got a great daughter who's you know got a great husband, two little kids, and one on the way. 
Ryan's got a little one, and I'm sure you know uh, they'll probably want to go again too. And this this is this is one of the great joys of life, grandparenthood. You know, it, I mean, we are we're lucky our daughter lives just down the road, and so Adele's very engaged with the grandkids, and and because they're close, I am you know less than her because you know she's at home helping, and I'm off working. But when I can, and Ryan's you know just over the bridge, but gone for large parts of the year now. So. You know, there's a we don't get quite as much time with um, him and Annika and Isabel, but you know we, we're travelling to the UK in September for a month to go and spend time with them and travel around, and um, it's just grandparenthood's one of the great joys. You know, we're absolutely loving it, and so that's another part of the reason. I mean, I, I need to give this game up because I need my weekends <laughs> back. Um, I want to play more golf. Um, you know, we got a place at Wahi Beach we'd love to spend more time at, and oh, we've got grandchildren we want to spend more time with. So it's just. For me now, I've been doing this for 40 or well, longer in a way, but you know, since I left school, I've been engaged in this game for 40 years with, n- with nearly a break. Uh, it's just time now for me to um, make sure that I've got more time on my hands to be present elsewhere. Sounds like there's some good years ahead of you. Hopefully. Very, very well Got to live them though, eh? Because you never know what's around the corner, so you've got to live them. I know Shay's got a, a nice outro lined up. I always try to put him on the spot, <laughs> Shay. No, I'm just happy that we got two of South Waikato North Bay Plenty's greatest goal kickers together on a uh, on a podcast <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, South Waikato. At the, at the I same played time. Gwyn Shield. Does Gwyn Shield still yeah, go down still, there? Yeah, I played Gwyn Shield in 1975. There no, in all, in all seriousness, <clears throat> amazing themes that you shared. Um, the depth that we've gone into has been incredible. Um a lot of people will go into this just thinking about the rugby stories and harking back to the 80s and the 90s, but yeah, the the, the topics and the things that we've covered are, are incredible. And I echo Stephen's words about um, you should be incredibly proud of, of your family and your parenthood and the great things that you're doing in the community well, as they're, well. They're, they're the your scene. greatest achievement, your family, I reckon. They, they, without, I mean, they are. And for me, they are. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for your time.